Heart disease is the most common killer of men in the United States, and high blood pressure is one of the greatest risk factors for heart disease. We've known this for a while, and we still have a hard time getting patients to comply with recommendations and medications. A recent study shows that the means of communication may be as important as the message itself, maybe even more so. Also, it suggests that healthcare need not take place in a doctor's office or be provided by a physician to be effective. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. To the research! This study, published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, took place in barbershops, which have long played a significant social, economic, and cultural role in African American life. Barbershops foster both confidentiality and camaraderie, which seems like a good environment to talk to men about hypertension. Years ago, researchers ran an experiment in which they trained barbers to check blood pressure and refer people with high levels to physicians. One group received this intervention, a control group received pamphlets handed out by barbers. Presumably, both groups received haircuts. Blood pressure values were only minimally improved in the intervention group. This was thought to be because even when patients were referred to primary care physicians, those doctors rarely treated their condition appropriately. The more recent study went further, removing physicians almost entirely from the process. The control group consisted of barbers who encouraged lifestyle modification or referred customers with high blood pressure to physicians. In the intervention group, barbers screened patients, then handed them off to pharmacists in the barber shops who met with the customers. They treated patients with medications and lifestyle changes according to set protocols, then updated physicians on what they'd done. The results were impressive. Six months into the trial, systolic blood pressure, the higher of the two blood pressure measures, in the control group had dropped about 9 millimeters mercury to 145.4, which is still high. In the intervention group, though, blood pressure had dropped 27 millimeters mercury to 125.8, which is super close to normal. If we define the goal of management to be less than 130 over 80, more than 63% of the intervention group achieved it, compared with less than 12% of the control group. It gets better. The rate of cohort retention, measuring how many of the patients remained plugged into the study and care throughout the entire process, was 95%. The barbershop customers are part of a population that is traditionally hard to reach. More than half of the participants lived in households earning less than $50,000 a year and more than 40% in households earning less than $25,000. On average, they were overweight or obese. About a third of them smoked and more than a fifth had diabetes. Yet the improvement in blood pressure was more than three times that of the average of previous pharmacist-based interventions seeking to improve blood pressure and many of those had focused on populations that are much easier to reach. One reason that this trial succeeded where others failed is that it adapted its intervention to overcome barriers. When barbers weren't consistently screening customers by measuring their blood pressure, the pharmacist stepped in to do that. When labs slowed things down, pharmacists brought measuring tests to the barbershops. The larger implications of this study shouldn't be ignored. Getting barbers involved meant health messages came from trusted members of the community. Locating the intervention in barbershops meant patients could receive care without inconvenience and with peer support. Using pharmacists meant that care could be delivered more efficiently. Of course, this study is limited by the usual sorts of questions. Who will pay for this in the real world? Who will do the training necessary to scale it up? Who will be responsible? But these concerns reflect the shortcomings of our current healthcare system, not those of the study. Healthcare reimbursement in the United States usually focuses on the clinical encounter at a physician's office or hospital. This reflects a belief that care is best offered there even when evidence says otherwise. Coverage and payment focus on the individual patient, not the community, even when research shows that the latter is more effective. Care often requires the participation of a physician, even when studies prove that it can be delivered well in many cases by mid-level practitioners. It's important to remember that we have the healthcare system we do because of history and economics, not because of studies that show it's optimally designed. Changes are most often made within the current framework. Those that buck the system are usually met with more resistance. Retail clinics may provide better access, but many professional organizations oppose them. Lifestyle changes can do more to improve health than drugs, but getting the system to recognize that diet and exercise might prevent diabetes and to pay for that intervention requires huge efforts and decades of time. If we really want to improve health on a large scale, especially with populations distrustful of the healthcare system, it seems we need to go to where they are to use people they trust to deliver messages and to allow care to occur without much of the infrastructure usually demanded for billing. 
Such efforts may not be traditional, but they may deliver much better results. Do you like the show? Always helps if you subscribe or like the episode down there, and it also helps if you can support us through Patreon.com. That's a subscription service, which allows you, the viewer, to help support the show any way you like, even as little as a dollar a month. It will always be free, but anything you can give to help make the show bigger and better is always appreciated. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Crafty Geek, and especially our Surgeon Admiral Sam. Again, if you're interested, patreon.com slash healthcare trash. While we've also got you, we've also got some great merch at htmerch.com. And as always, my book, The Bad Food Bible, still available in stores. Appreciate it if you pick up a copy.